Welcome back to the Contributor Corner for Run Radio. Jennifer Rideout, Jennifer the Archaeologist, is back with us. What do you have today? Hi, Jenna. Um, so in previous contributions, I mentioned that archaeologists can often help in identifying locations of cemeteries, uh, marked and unmarked, historic and pre-contact. Um, so this, this can be helpful for developers uh, working with a new property, for um, descendants, just private individuals who are looking to find um, graves that they, they like maybe know generally where their ancestors were buried, but they're having trouble finding the cemetery. This is something that people like me, especially historic archaeologists that also dabble in genealogy um, and historical research, um, are really good at helping people out with. So I just wanted to um, give you a little insight into how a cultural resource management specialist would go about finding such historic cemeteries. Um, first, we review historic property maps, which are really cool. If you've never seen one, they're called plat maps. Um, every county has one. Some, some of them have several different versions. Some of them are 100, uh, 150 years old. So they're, they're really cool documents if, you're, if you nerd out on historic maps like I do. Um, after you've looked over the maps, that can tell you where the property boundaries were, who the owners were at different periods in time. So you can take that information and you can go and search the deed records that are on file with the county. And you can get a whole chain of custody. So you can know everybody, uh, the entire line of everybody that's owned your property. And you can also move to census records and find out all the members of that family. You can take that list of people you know that lived on that property and go and search public and church um, records to find um, uh, death information, death certificates, death registries that often will tell you exactly where the person was buried. So you can um, just go through the list and make sure that nobody was reported to have been buried on the Smith property. Um, but if somebody is listed as being buried on so-and-so's farm, um, then you can go and look at some other resources. Um, if the graves aren't marked, they're generally located near a house. So again, back to the plat maps, those showed us where houses were. Mm -hmm. So you can look around where a house used to be. Often the family cemetery would be in the yard or within sight of the house. Um, it might be if there's like a bluff or a really cool hill on the property and like a nice prominent landform, that's a good spot for a cemetery. And if like further out west in Oklahoma, if there's not a lot of trees, they're usually in tree and fence lines because those are places where trees are more likely to like grow up and you know have some big majestic shade tree to bury people underneath. Um, so those are places that we would look and you can look at old topographic maps that the USGS makes or old aerial photos. And believe it or not, we do have aerial photos um, for many states that go back to the 1920s. It's really cool to see those photos. Um, and you can see where houses used to be, where big trees were, where there might be a little grove of trees that might be a cemetery, things like that is what we're looking for. Um, but it's also important to note that even if you have a historic cemetery on your property, um, especially if it was one of the families, one of the pioneer families that um, enslaved other people, um, there's often a second cemetery. So even if there's one marked cemetery, if they if they um, had slaves, there's very likely to be a secondary cemetery that's in kind of downslope or a less prominent area, but near the family cemetery that's all very rarely marked. So that would be something you would want to keep in mind that not, I mean, even if you know there's a cemetery there, there might still be a second cemetery and you, you really don't want to be the one to disturb that cemetery. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, uh, so if burials have been confirmed on the property, then we can, uh, we can either do a survey and look for physical evidence of a cemetery, um, even a quote unquote unmarked cemetery will still leave these little depressions, um, and or there'll be a, a field stone, a, like a line of field stones that that's just not where they belong, they're natural stones from nearby, but they're just in a weird place. So we look for things like that, or like I said, we check the aerial photos. And um, we can actually track down some cemeteries that never had a gravestone on them. I, I, for a project in Oklahoma just last month, I helped find a cemetery that went unmarked for, I think, about 110 years. Oh and just goodness. through some aerial photos, some property searches with a coworker, and talking to a couple of great grandchildren, we managed to isolate uh, where this family cemetery was, probably within a, a hundred feet or so. Oh my goodness. And a little bit earlier back, you had mentioned something about someone wanted to know how to take care of that area. What does that entail? I mean, a lot of people might not even consider there are certain 
ways to take care of that property once it's discovered that it has a burial? Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, one thing you'd want to identify um, what are usually um, ornamental plants. So there are some very standardized plants that were put on graves between like the Civil War and World War II, really standardized plants. And even if there's no other indication, sometimes just the presence of those plants tells us there's a cemetery there. And you'd, you'd want to maintain and not pull out those um, plants because those actually are the only things marking the graves. Um, you want to be careful removing brush and anything that's where you're pulling up on roots. You don't want to do that because you can really dislodge things in the cemetery. So if you're trying to get the brush off an overgrown cemetery, you want to be very careful how you do that. Um, also, there are some types of graves. They're called, um, I think, uh, marital graves, cradle graves. There's several different names for them. But people would put a ring of rocks around the grave. And a lot of times when people very well-meaning are coming in to clean up cemeteries, they, they're they thinking that those those are just stones that are kind of left after the dirt settled in and they remove them. <laughs> so um, any, any stones that are in a pattern, um, even if they're not particularly pretty, they were probably put there intentionally. So you, you don't want to be the one to chuck all that out of the way because that's a very specific grave type. And it's kind of cool if those are left in place. Um, another big thing is to be really careful when you are cleaning headstones. There are specific cleaners that will kill moss and lichen. Um, I think it's called uh, D2. It's a little mm -hmm. bit on the expensive side, but it doesn't deteriorate the stone. So you never want to use anything abrasive. Um, it's really popular for people to like rub chalk over so that they can take a picture of the letters, but that's actually oh. over time will destroy a natural stone or a cement marker. So we really recommend you never do those chalk rubbings hmm. it doesn't it doesn't look like you're messing it up immediately when you do it but long term you are destroying the headstone good insight thank you so much for sharing jennifer the archaeologist listen to her and our other contributors every weekday at runradio.net